leadership is seeing something that needs to be done and not just passively saying, oh, that's somebody else's job or, oh, you know, that's too bad. But you see something that could be better and you do something about it. What is going on to my classy listeners here? I know that's so corny. I promise I'm going to say it every episode. I just wrapped up an amazing show with Mr. Tim Joyner. Uh, His podcast is Grow With Tim. This guy is a serial entrepreneur. He owns six companies, a lot of them doing well over seven figures. He started when he was 13 as an entrepreneur, selling computers, placing ads. This is before the internet days. He's still a young man. He's only 40 years old and so much more runway to grow. Um, We speak about leadership skills. We go into like how to hire the A-team how to develop relationships, how to organize your systems. Because as you can imagine, someone who owns six companies, how are you keeping the flow going? Like how are you arranging meetings? How are you, you know, empowering your employees? We get all tactical, all into that good stuff. So stick around. This episode is packed with insightful nuggets just like that. I promise you won't be disappointed. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Looking forward to continuing the show. All right, what is going on, everyone? I appreciate everyone for tuning in. I'm with my good friend, Tim Joyner. I'm so excited to have this guy on the show. I met him in Austin, Texas a couple weeks ago. Uh, We did a great uh, mastermind networking event with this company called M3. Got to meet this billionaire named Drayton McLean um, and learned some invaluable insights. But even more importantly, it allowed me to connect with Mr. Joyner, who I was instantly impressed with, with his wide breadth of entrepreneurship. To call him a serial entrepreneur is probably an understatement. The, and I have to say also, this guy's a humble guy. I had to pry this out of him. He doesn't come across as this, the person who's beating his chest at all, as all. Uh, but he owns six companies, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and I'm a little bit of a boy wonder. So I, I really can't wait to get involved in the story and learn more about him. So Tim, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it, man. Steve, glad to be here. I need to get you to introduce me at all my events. You, you make me sound amazing. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's my old MC DJ voice. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll keep that going. Thank uh, I'll keep that in mind for the next time too. So uh, I I love to you know let people get a sense of who you are and kind of rewind the clock a little bit to the beginning days, um, because the story you told me was really fascinating. What age were you when you first started your business, so to speak, or had your first sale? Because it's a really interesting story. I was involved like a lot of teenagers are mowing lawns and shoveling snow and that kind of thing. But honestly, the the real beginning that they trace back to when I was probably three or four or five years old, my dad had a rental property and I spent a lot of time with my dad and, um, he would like, from the time I was big enough to hold a paintbrush or a paint roller, he would uh, teach me to paint. I remember painting the insides of closets as a little kid, I think because you can't mess up too bad inside a closet, but what that already is cool because he's teaching me how to paint. But what I really love about my dad is he went one step further and he would teach me how to create an invoice. So I'd get out my crayons and write, you know, painted two closets, 25 cents each, 50 cents. And here's my invoice. And I get my two quarters for my dad or whatever. So like from the time I can write, I'm, I'm learning these basic business skills. And so that was kind of the very, very beginning. That's pretty cool. And it's funny enough that because my father also owned rental properties, but wasn't as forgiving as yours. <laughs> he would, uh, he would have me paint a few, like start painting, like say a closet and then get upset that uh, of the poor quality I was doing as a 10 year old uh, and just take the brush out of my hand. He's like, just stay in school, man. He goes, maybe this isn't uh, for you. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that talk about early education, um, which is pretty, which is pretty good worth that ethics. I always lo- love to hear the, those stories. And uh, I know as you progressed as an early teenager, you know, as a budding entrepreneur, you saw an opportunity that, that I found pretty astounding. You said you saw something, an ad in the paper for a computer. Something along those lines? So you're on the right track. So I, I placed the ad. Uh, this was back in the early days of the internet, and nobody was really doing business on the internet, right? You, The idea of giving your credit card to a stranger on the other side of the world was anathema to most people because you know, you, there was no trust. There were no little padlocks up in the browser or whatever. Like Nobody knew how this thing worked. And so there was a company called Z Auction, kind of a precursor in eBay, and they were trying to pioneer the online auction space. And so I um, got on there and, and invested really my life savings in buying a computer. At a time when computers were selling for maybe $2,000 or so on average, I got this and computer. And just for my audience knows, how old are you at this time? Oh, I was probably 13. I think I was 13. 13. So yeah, I've been was, mowing lawns and saving my yeah, money, Yeah, I was doing right? World of Warcraft, so you were ahead of me. <laughs> 
So I I invested pretty much everything that I'd saved up in my life until that point, which was eight hundred dollars. And I got this computer. It was probably worth two grand. But remember, it's the auction space, venture capital back, they're hemorrhaging money, trying to prove out the model. So you were able to buy things way below cost. So anyway, I got this computer and I and I put that ad that you talked about in the paper and I said, um, nice computer for sale, whatever, brand new list out the specs. And I sold it in one week for twelve hundred bucks which was like a whole summer of mowing lawns, right? In a week, I thought, Not this bad. is amazing. So I did it again. Uh, and then eventually I found a kit where I could even get it a little bit cheaper and I could put the thing, and it took me like three months to figure out how to put it together and make it work. But then I started selling computers that I was building. And um, so anyway, that that was kind of the, the start of the computer business. That's amazing. And And did you always, from a young age, want to be this entrepreneur or was this, at the time, it means then like, great, I just made all my summer money in just a couple of transactions and I'm off yeah, to races so now my dad uh, and was focusing on my studies. Like what was the mentality back then? Yeah, my dad was self-employed um, my whole life and most of his life. And uh, mom too, like they both worked in the family business or businesses. And so I, that was really just normal to me. I, I never, like to this day, Steve, I've never had a real job. Like I, I was talking <laughs> to somebody this morning and they said, you know, you're kind of unemployable. <laughs> You know, I'm, it's true. Like, I don't, if I had to get a job, I don't, how do you make a resume? How do you go interview? Like, I've never done all that stuff. It, this was just normal to me. So it wasn't a conscious choice. It was just kind of like, this, this is how life works. No kidding. So with that, did you, did you end up going to higher education or just kind of went right into business ownership at that point? Yeah, I did. That's a long story. I had no plans to. So I was homeschooled my whole life. And uh, in the state that I lived in, Illinois, there weren't a lot of regulations around homeschooling. Um, don't get me wrong. I got a great education, but on paper, like I didn't have a high school, I still don't have a high school diploma. I didn't get a transcript or anything like that. It was kind of, you know, off the books. And so, um, I didn't have any intention of, I, by the time I was 18, I had a couple of businesses. I had employees. I, um, yeah, I had a plan to get to a million dollars. I was going to have be a millionaire by age 30 and I had it all mapped out. And so, you know, why would I go to school? Right. Um, and it's a long story, but the, the short version is that God really got it a hold of my attention and I realized that maybe I was I was building treasure that wasn't gonna last. Uh, Matthew six talks about laying up treasures on earth versus laying up treasures in heaven. You really got a hold of my attention. Uh, interesting story there. But I ended up going to a Christian school um, primarily not so much for the education, but more for like the spiritual greenhouse effect. Like I wanted to be um, surrounded by by people and that, that love God and that would you know, teach me to do the same. So that's uh, maybe another story for another day. But I did end up going not just for undergrad, but then I got two graduate degrees, including an MBA, um, all from that same Christian institution. No kidding. And, and all this while, while you're a full student, you mentioned you had a, a, already a few businesses. You were ke- keeping them afloat as you're committing to full studies? Yeah. So I was running a couple of businesses from my dorm room um, and I had to get special permission from the IT department to like open up special ports for FTP and stuff that normally they wouldn't allow students to do. Uh, so I was building websites for people. And I was hosting websites for people. I was doing some IT and other technology related stuff. Um, a, a few other things too, but that was the main thing that helped me pay my way through college. Really cool, man. So it, it seems like you, you have a little bit of an IT background and that was like your initial core businesses. Um, h- how did you know what business to start? Like, did you look for opportunities? Like, what was, was there ever an aha moment of, I found a problem I can solve for better, cheaper yeah. and better and faster service? Like how would that work? Yeah, that's all. So I've, I think I just started the 20th company. Uh, well, either start, started or acquired. I've bought some and I built some, but um, I'm, I think I'm on number 20 and all of them have been in the same category where there was opportunity and I was positioned to seize that opportunity. So in the beginning with the computer, somebody told me about this, this site called the auction. I thought, you know, that's way cheaper than I could buy it at the local computer store. I bet, you know, I could, Basic, I didn't know this word back then, but arbitrage it, right? I could buy low and sell high. Um, and it wasn't very long before companies like Dell entered the scene and those profit margins, instead of making $400 per, per computer, I was making 50 bucks. But by that time, I'd sold enough of them that people were coming back to me asking how to fix them. Like, how do I install this printer? Or I'm getting this error message or whatever. And so, there again, opportunity. Back then, tech support was always free and and it was pretty good. Like you could get on the phone with somebody that knew it. So I would take these computers back to my bedroom. I'd call up Microsoft or Intel or whoever sold this part. 
and I'd spend hours on the phone and I basically got an IT degree over the phone, but I would charge my customers to fix their problems. And uh, then somebody said, Hey, can you help me build a website? And I was like, absolutely. I can build it. I didn't know how to build a website, but I, there was a library. I had books. And so I got, you know, HTML for dummies or whatever. I figured out how to build a website. I ended up building a first website for my city, the city of Freeport, for my local public library system, for the YMCA. And some of those got like front page news stories. And so people would come to me with problems and I'd figure out how to fix them. And that's kind of the story of my life. Like, here's a need. I'll figure out how to fill that need. And, oh, I think there's a business here. It almost seems fortuitous, like it was our organic growth of like, as you succeed and improve yourself of like, I can do this, I can do this. People are coming to you with, hey, you solve this problem. Can you also solve this problem for me? And now you're building up this trust, this relationship, build, this relationship is starting to grow. I yep. know, uh, I think if memory serves, the mayor, like yeah. had, I had a little op about you at the time. Yeah. The, the mayor called me and asked me to, well, first of all, build the first website for the city, but then he also had me uh, run some of his campaign, like a lot of the technology and marketing for his campaign, I built a website for his re-election campaign for two of them. Um, and again, that got me more opportunity. But I, I've always told people, prepare for opportunity before you have it. And that's kind of the story of my life. Like I did not know as a 13-year-old or as a 16-year-old or an 18-year-old what I was going to be doing now at 40, um, that I'd be owning a bunch of companies and doing some things that I think anyway are pretty cool. But, but I've, I've been preparing for opportunity for years and years and years before I knew. So building relationships and acquiring skills and saving money and like building systems and all kinds of stuff that then when the opportunity presents itself, you're ready to go. Right. A lot of people talk about luck. I think, I mean, luck, providence, whatever you want to call it. Sure. That happens, but it's also, uh, some people know how to make their own luck and it's a matter of being prepared so that when opportunity strikes, you can seize it. Most people have opportunity. They don't know what to do with it. Um, but if you're prepared, you can take it. So I think that's been, I, I can't take credit for like having it all planned out. Like, oh, I'm going to do this and then this and then this. But I've just prepared a lot and opportunity shows up and I take it. It, it sounds like you, you invested in yourself and building out your skill sets. So when something did come arise, you're like, I know how to do this now. Yeah, and and if sure. you didn't, you, you learned the skill as the, as the problem kind of arose and just got better and better at it. So it's, it. it's honestly, at, to your point, I'm not a big Luck definitely plays a part in, in people's lives. Like we're, I'm, we're blessed that we're born in American soil and not right, like for sure. we're way worse. For sure. Um, but there is a lot that goes into just like, you know, going with your God given talent, so to speak, and like yep. making, putting in the work, kind of build upon that. So, and that, that kind of leads me, you know, kind of leading into your journey of, of, you know, having these companies being a teenage, teenager into your early 20s. We're at, at this point, are these businesses producing seven figures? Or are they still in the six figure range at, at this point? Yeah. So different ones, of course, are at different levels. Um, but the so at this point, the six major ones, uh, the probably the most interesting one to a lot of people is a software company. We're a SaaS company, software as a service, servicing the thrift store industry. Um, and so yes, that's uh, that's north of seven figures. Uh, several others that I either have been involved in or am involved in our seven figures, but I've also got some that uh, we've just started. I've got a couple with a partner, two different partners that are, I mean, just breaking a couple hundred thousand dollars, like they're, they're still kind of fledgling businesses. So all different stages, but, um, yes, absolutely. My, my, um, the goal right now, I've got one company in particular that I'm planning to sell within the next, um, uh, probably three years or so. Um, and I'm looking at a $40 million exit. So I don't know for sure if I'll be able to hit it. Like I haven't done it yet. And I've never sold it. I've sold several companies. I've never sold one for that much. So you can check in with me in a few years and see if I succeed. But I'm the, the price tag I'm putting on it is $40 million in three or four years. That's a, that's an incredible goal to aim for. And I, I if I was a betting man, I'd place my chips on your table. <laughs> well, thank, your you. Track thank you. So, and that gets me into, I want to shift a little bit to mindset because I think when people hear running six companies, they might think of like the Elon Musk type where he like sleeps in a warehouse on the floor and just like pulls his all nighters and is like, you know, not the best person to work for as a reputation. You don't strike me as that type of guy where I know you work I hope hard. Not. Yeah, I hope yeah, not. but I don't think that you're going to be a tyrant of a, of a, of a, um, a boss and right. like want to be involved in every decision making. So what kind of mindset do you have when you're running these six companies? And we'll get into the meat and potatoes of how you do it. Because I, I don't imagine that you're a one-man show. Right. So what, what, what's the mindset of, of like the 
I guess, the organization that you're having for these multitudes of companies? So a couple of things come to mind. First of all, money for me is not really uh, the end. It's not the goal. It's uh, not necessarily even a means to an end. It, it's more like a way of keeping score for me. So like, it's fun. A game, if you will. Yeah, it's a game. Exactly. It, it's fun to make, you know, more money this year than I made last year, or more money this week than I did last week or whatever. And, it, and it's fun to kind of compare and look at, you know, averages and like what percentile of wealth you're in or whatever. It's fun because it's, it's fun to win. Um, but it's not really about money. I mean, uh, there are a lot of billionaires and multimillionaires out there that are really sad people, right? And and uh, not not uh, not in a good place. So, so it's not about uh, making money. I've got three kids and uh, I'm active in my church and, and have a life outside of business. And I think those things are um, frankly more important and more, in many cases, more fulfilling, even though I love my work. Don't get me wrong. I love work and I love the things that I'm doing. Um, but but there's more to life than just that. So yes, absolutely. I'm not sleeping on a factory floor. I'm not um, I'm not working. Now, in the beginning, in the early days, I absolutely worked lots and lots of 80 hour weeks. Like that was normal before I had kids and um, in the early days. But now, 45, 50 hours is a pretty normal work week for me. I'll take vacations and actually check out and, and be completely devoid of work for a week or 10 days at a time, sometimes longer. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to, to strike a, a respectable balance there. So uh, what, I'm what not sure if I answered you your question. Have, uh, yeah, the great answer. I, but what discipline do you have when you leave the office, so to speak, and you walk into your home and there's an issue at work? Are you going yeah. to respond to it? Like, what is your protocol there? Is there is there a total, like, I'm with my family now and this can wait until tomorrow? I'm just curious to see yeah. what your thought process is. So, again, in the early days, there was a lot more that was riding on me. But at this point, I don't want to be the bottleneck or anything or be the um, the only guy that can do something, right? So I have, for most of these businesses, pretty good teams in place and Hopefully there are very few things that can't wait until tomorrow. I mean, I, you know, the, the kinds of classic things that happen, a server goes down or there, you know, there's something that is really important. Typically there's somebody else that's going to be able to handle that. And so hopefully I don't get called in. That's not to say that I never take a call at dinner or whatever. Sometimes something comes up and it's really important, but it's not nearly as hard anymore as it used to be. And that's because of systems and people. So, so, and so all that getting to say, into... when I'm home, I'm usually, I'm usually home, at least until the kids get in bed. Sometimes if I have something to do, I'll work for an hour or something after kids are in bed. But um, for the most part, I keep working at the office. Now, you mentioned about your people, and I, I would love to get more into the relationships you've developed with your, your uh, teammates. With these six companies, how, how did you go about hiring these A players so they're not bothering you when you're at the dinner table with your family or on a Sunday or what have you? And what kind of organization did you develop and systems that a listener can maybe take to heart and improve on, on their side? Yeah. So I'll take those in reverse order. Um, what kind of systems? So probably, I don't know, I, it's hard to say the best advice you've ever given. I've been given lots of advice and lots of really good advice. But one of the best things I was ever given was from a business coach that I worked with for a number of years. He said, Tim, you've got to have regular uh, recurring scheduled meetings with everybody that reports to you. And at the time, that was a pretty novel thought to me. Like it was a small business or a couple of businesses I was running, but they were all pretty small and we were close, like both geographically and like relationally. And so if I needed something, I just walked over and asked them to do it. Or if they had a question for me, they just walked over and asked me to do it. Right. And it was just very fluid. And, and he said, no, you've got to have regular scheduled meetings with agendas. And that didn't really make sense to me, but I kind of started trying it. And now that's, that's the only way that you can do this. So for example, uh, yesterday, Tuesday, uh, the software company that I spoke of at, um, I don't remember the times without looking at my calendar, but I think it's nine o'clock, uh, every Tuesday I meet with my director of customer service at 10 o'clock. I meet with my director of DevOps. At 12 o'clock, I meet with my director of operations. At one o'clock, I meet with my director of implementation. At, and, and during each of those meetings, both of us have prepared agendas. So I know exactly what questions I have, what status updates I'm looking for, what things I need them to do, like all that's, so as I'm, I'm gonna finish this podcast, Steve, and probably think, oh, 
I need to talk to Scott about such and such. I'm not going to pick up the phone and call Scott because that's going to interrupt Scott, take him off his game. It's also going to interrupt me. So I'm just going to pull out my phone or my laptop or my tablet or whatever and put on the agenda with two clicks. I'll have it up. I'm going to put on the agenda whatever it is that I want to talk to Scott about. And now next Tuesday when I see Scott, I'm going to say, hey, you got to talk about this. Scott's doing the same thing. So from one week to the next, unless it's truly a time sensitive like crisis, and hopefully we don't have very many of those, I'm going to deal with everything that we need to deal with in a one hour block. And it's, I've got all the context I need. I'm in that zone. I'm thinking about that business. I can ask questions. We can make decisions. So I make a lot of decisions in each one of those meetings, but I've got all the context I need to make a good decision. And then they can execute, they and their teams, right? They're all leaders in their own right. They and their teams can execute all of that. So I can go from one meeting to the next to the next, sometimes from one company to the next to the next and have everything I need to make the good decision but I'm not actually bogged down in carrying them out or trying to remember everything I had to talk about or constantly being interrupted, right? That's the big thing. Your attention is so fragile. And if I, if I get interrupted, some studies show it takes like 30 or 40 minutes to get back in the zone, what you were doing. So with this series of meetings, I'm meeting with all of the leaders of all of these companies regularly. I'm hardly ever interrupted. I can stay focused on one thing at a time. And, um, Anyway, that's, that's kind of how I lead those and how I survive in what could otherwise be a really chaotic, you know, stressful situation. I, I just wrote down what you just said um, because how powerful it is because I need to implement that into my life because my phone, which thankfully is on Do Not Disturb right now, I'm afraid to glance at it. Um, it rings just constantly through people who right. need my attention for something and it right. breaks my concentration on whatever project I happen to be working on in any given moment. And to your point, it takes me 15 minutes to kind of get back into the swing of things, if not longer. So I love the fact that it's agenda specific. So like you have to speak to your your uh, director, Scott, and say, hey, how are we doing with this? What about this? And then he's going to have questions for you. That way it's not a loosey-goosey type of like, what's right. going on, man? Yeah, and they waste right. everyone's time. And oh, I should have said that. You jot it down. And I'm curious, what software are you using to track these agendas that you can schedule? Like, is there any, yeah. are you using monday.com for the back end? Just, just for my own purposes, I'm very yeah. curious. No, honestly, it's a pretty low tech solution. There are probably better ways to do this, but I use Google Docs. Um, All right. So, I, so here, but, but there's a little bit of magic to it. So Google Docs has a great heading and outline tool. I don't know if you've used that part of it, but if you make things a heading, so um, you can just go up and pick H1 or H2 or whatever, right? So I'll use headings. At the very top, so one document per meeting series. So if I meet with you, Steve, every week, I'm going to have a Steve agenda, right? That's going to be the document. And it's going to be in a folder based on the company and the department or whatever I'm in. So um, there's, at the very top, there's a heading called future. And every time I think about something I want to talk to you about in the future, the next meeting, I'm going to add a bullet point under there. Then right underneath that is whatever the next meeting is. So it's basically in revert, except for future. It's all in reverse order. So let's say I'm going to meet with you later today. Today is, as we record this, I don't know when it's going to come out, but it's September 8th. So I'm going to have September 8th, 2023. That's going to be a heading. And then there are going to be a bunch of bullet points and maybe sub bullet points or whatever. But everything I'm going to talk about is a bullet point. Underneath that is going to be September 1st when I met with you last week. And behind that is going to be August, whatever. And every time I start a new meeting with you, I'm just going to squeeze a new heading in between future and whatever my last meeting was. And then there's this great outline tool that shows up on the sidebar and I can just click, I can see a list of all those headings and I can click right on it. So I can click and I can see what did you and I talk about three months ago? And by the way, I keep in there the decisions and the action items. So every meeting is going to end up with some action items. I'm going to say, all right, Steve, let's say that you work for me. Um, you're probably going to have two, three, four action items with deadlines. And so there's going to be bold at the end of the meeting. Steve's going to do this by this date. Steve's going to do this by this date. Steve's going to and uh, then next week when I meet with you, I can just click that button and say, all right, Steve, tell me about such and such. And you're actually, I'm, I'm really not even going to ask you because you're going to tell, you're probably going to tell me, hey, we talked about this. Here's what I did. We talked about this. Here's what I did and so on. And um, I can, you know, we can keep each other honest that way. But that's the tool. It's just Google. That's, that, that's brilliant, man. That, that holds everyone accountable as well. Like this is what we spoke about last week. Did you, did it, before you even get to it, like there, you, your teammates are so good, like, Yep, it took care of X, Y, and Z, and right. this is what I'm working on right now. It, it, there's that way it, it removes the what ifs from the equation. Like, did you do this? What if that right. happens? What if this? It, and it keeps everyone 
on pace. Now that now that's brilliant on the individual basis. Are you having greater team meetings now where it's like you're uh, um, like meeting like, OK, I'm meeting with the entire division of whatever company yeah, you're working on? For sure. So, again, depending on the company and the size. But, for example, the leaders of the company are typically going to meet also on a weekly basis. And that's where we're going to look at KPIs. So key performance indicators, whatever is most important to that company. So customer satisfaction or uh, time required to resolve an issue or uh, sales last month or number of incoming leads in the last 90 days or you know, wh whatever it is that we're tracking, probably all of those kinds of things. And we're going to manage those KPIs. So every week we're going to look at them together and see which ones are out of line, which ones are not meeting targets. And then we're going to talk about what, what do we need to do and, and here again, we're going to end up with action items. All right, Sam, you're going to do this. Bob, you're going to do that. Sue, you're going to do this. And by the way, I should hasten to say, it's not me dictating all that. It's not like I'm the micromanager that's telling. The team is saying, okay, well, what could we do about this? Well, I could do this. And great, Sam. Okay. And then that's going to get noted as an action item. And then next week, we're going to come back. Yes, we're going to look at KPIs, but we're also going to get reports from everybody about what they accomplished in the last week. So yes, there's the leadership meeting. And then Depending on the size of those teams, a lot of those leaders are having their own team meetings with all of their direct reports to, you know, disseminate this information and this vision throughout the organization. But for me, I'm typically meeting one-on-one -on -one with each of my direct reports, and then all together, the leaders are meeting typically once a week. And then uh, once a quarter, we'll probably do an off-site strategy meeting for half a day. And once a year, it's coming up about this time of the year that we're planning now, 2024. Uh, in fact, in about two weeks, I'm going to be taking a team to the mountains of North Carolina. We'll rent a big Airbnb. We'll spend two and a half or three days up there and plan out what are we going to accomplish in 2024 and then rinse and repeat for the other companies. So that's uh, that's the basic uh, rhythm of um, now. Is of there, is there an any cross pollination board. between these companies? Like, do they work hand in hand with each other? Sometimes. Um, not as much as you might think. That was the original plan when I, you know, when I decided <laughs> that I wanted multiple companies and wanted to create that kind of impact, I thought there's going to be this ecosystem of companies that are mutually interested in one another's success and they're going to be each other's clients and whatever. That hasn't happened as much as I thought it would because I've got software and shoes and real estate and, it, you know, um, artificial intelligence and social video. There, and so, yes, there are times, for example, the social video company um, that helps entrepreneurs amplify their message and get it out, uh, serve some of these other companies. And there's some cross-pollination, but um, I probably need to work on that. Probably There probably should be more. Yeah, it, it's it's amazing to me that how diversified your portfolio of companies is from shoes to real estate. Like you don't really, those wires typically don't cross as much, but that's right. interesting. That Going back to like just find, looking for the opportunity and you found it type of thing. So And, and I wouldn't recommend that for most people. I mean, for... The advice I often give clients, uh, if they're coming to me on a consulting basis or even a fraction, sometimes I do fractional work. Um, for the most part, the more laser focused you are on a goal, the more successful you're going to be. Um, and, and that was true of me in the early years. I, maybe it's my ADHD-ness, I don't know. Um, but I really like, I, I love going to Brazil and working on the shoe business. And then I love just as much the fact that the next day, I'm solving software problems and the next day I'm acquiring a, you know, rental property and it, it's interesting to me. It keeps life fresh and I've got teams that can do the focus work. And so it's working for me, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for most people unless you're ADHD yeah, like uh, I am. I would say ADHD. So every entrepreneur I've interviewed so far has brought up that word. We all <laughs> suffer from this malady where we're just like, I want, and so I have the real estate, my own portfolio, property management, brokerage construction company and now a, a consulting business and it's yeah. all like I, like my wife's like are you just trying to run yourself to the ground i'm like no i just have so many things i'm interested in i love right. all this stuff right so you Agreed. can wear like many many hats is an understatement yeah. um and so with these with that being said with these meetings these teams that you develop it looks like a very good operational system and whatever works for you and i always say you don't need to have this advanced new technology that came out um I always say embrace AI, but if you, if Google works for you and it's easy for organization, it takes just, I'm sure you got it down to a science where it's seconds of your time to kind of to right. make these agendas, go for it. Um, with that being said, like you as a leader, because now you, you, you people are looking up to you for a lot of the visionary things. What elements would you say or personal characteristics are you carrying or you recommend someone look for it of ways to improve 
that has worked for you and has not worked for you as a leader of these companies? Mm. The big question. Um, so I read a book as a teenager. Um, oh man, now I'm drawing a blank. I can see the name of it. I think it was actually spiritual leadership is what it's called, but it, it's a little bit misleading because you think of like, is I going to teach you how to be a pastor or something? And, and, and that wasn't really it. It was, um, really taking the model of Jesus Christ as the ultimate servant leader. And at, at its core, leadership is just seeing something that needs to be done and doing it, right? So that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do all the work, but, but you see confusion and a leader provides clarity, right? You see apathy and a leader provides motivation. Um, you see a problem that needs to be solved, then a leader provides a solution or coordinates the solution. Um, you see, so leadership is seeing something that needs to be done and not just passively saying, oh, that's somebody else's job or, oh, I, you know, that's too bad. But you see something that could be better and you do something about it. Um, now, I believe that most effective leaders are better at, at not doing the thing, but facilitating the thing because you can... You know, the bigger the lever you have, the more impact you can have. So if you're trying to do everything, well, you only got so many hours in a week, but if you've got teams of people, you can get a whole lot more done. So I'm not saying that a leader does everything, but, but that's what leadership is. So for me, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, first of all, get great people in place and then make sure they have the clarity uh, around the vision. Like what, what, what hill are we trying to take? What island are we sailing towards? So make sure they have clarity, make sure they have the resources necessary to get there, like what's in their way. Um, make sure that they, they have the um, creative problem solving skills to you know, figure out how to overcome obstacles that are going to get in the way and then let them do their job. And so uh, I don't know if that's very helpful, but for me, I'm not the smartest person in the room. I routinely try to hire people that are smarter than me that are better at whatever it is that they're going to do. I'm trying to cast a vision and facilitate their success, but, but not really tell them how to do their jobs. You know, I, I think uh, I want to harp on something said about that, the vision and mission statement, right? Because I think a lot of companies lack that or it's superficial with lack of any real meaning behind it. So if you can get your tribe, so to speak, behind you and say, Hey, this is the mountain we're looking to summit right now. These are the goals. This is why we're doing it. This is our purpose. We want to help these X, Y, Z type of cl clients or customers. The fact that you even have a vision, surprisingly, you would think like everyone, of course, every company has a vision. No, not, not right. from what I have encountered. It's very, it's, it's, it's inorganic matter almost. Like they haven't really truly defined it. If you can get people behind you to your point to really follow you, that's when it's that you have explosive growth because now yeah. people are working as though it's their own business, not just an employee mentality because yep. they feel like they're part of something. Yep. So and it and it provides so much uh simplification when you're trying to make decisions like i used to think you know these consultants would come in and help you create a vision statement or mission statement or core values list or whatever uh, you know okay they're going to leave and there's going to be this binder that sits on a shelf and collects dust and doesn't I, not not so not if you do it right right if you do it right your your core values for example are going to help you with every decision that you make you, you just pass it through that filter and say, all right, we can do A or B. Well, which one aligns with our core values? Which one is going to get us closer to our mission? Which one's going to help us achieve our vision? Um, so, yeah, I think done well, vision, mission, and core values are incredibly valuable. Absolutely. And and even you can even get as granular of like what clients you want to take if they're going to help you accomplish the mission or is this just a way to make a quick right. buck? Right. Like I can take it personally where I've been approached countless times by HOA developments who have, it would have been thousands of dollars extra on a monthly revenue where I would just said no to, I'm like, Hey, our, my core vision is residential. Like I don't have any desire to do this type of work. I'm sure we could do it, but that's just not really part of who we identify or, who, or our thoughts align. Uh, I'm sure it's, but you've had opportunities you've turned down, I'm sure as well, that just didn't make sense for your, right. your mission. statement. In the beginning, there was one criteria, right? Is your money green? Um, I, I, I mean, that's, that's way, There's way, way back. <laughs> yeah, but but hopefully you mature um, and eventually you have people that are like, instead of you trying to get them to do business with you, it's them trying to get you to take their business, right? Um, and that's, that's the ideal. 
And how are you holding yourself accountable as a leader as far as like making sure that you're not either bulldozing other, any thought process? Like how are you opening up the dialogue for your teammates? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think one of the one of the best answers to that is coaching, right? So I have worked with coaching business coaches and and in some cases coaching organizations, not unlike M3, how we met, right? Um, where there's other people that have been where I want to get to and I'm meeting with them regularly and, and I've given them permission to have, you know, honest conversations with me, sometimes hard conversations with me. So for most of my career, I've worked with business coaches. I've probably spent, I don't know, Steve, I've never added it up. I probably have spent a quarter of a million dollars on coaches and professional development. Um, and, uh, that, that's been really, really valuable for me. So that's one way that I hold myself accountable is I enlist other people to help me with that. Um, but I also tell my leaders, you know, there, there's, it's easy to become the leader that can do no wrong. And you're like, you know, there's some pride and arrogance and stubbornness that can slip in there, but that is a way, I mean, that's a way to certain death. Not to mention that it's just it's difficult to work with a person like that. But I mean, just practically speaking, if, if you're the only one that can solve this problem, your leaders are all going to give up trying to solve problems. They don't want to get their wrist slapped, right? If you're the only one that can do no. So, so um, just this morning, I was I'm leading a team meeting and I reminded people of the three criteria for making a decision. I said, look, and I've said this to all of my teams many, many times. Um, I want everybody to make decisions at the lowest level possible. In other words, I don't want to be a bottleneck where you say, oh, well, I need to wait for the CEO or the owner or the partner or whatever to, to make this decision um, because I can't make all the decisions. We're not going to be successful that way. And, and even if I can make some of them, I'm going to be slow because I'm going to have to get more information and you're going to have to get on my schedule and that's not going to work. So I want the decision happening at the lowest level possible in the organization. And to do that, I encourage people to always have a bias for action. And I say, just check three things. One, do I have enough information to make this decision? So if you're making, you know, depending on the level that you're at in the organization, whatever, but let's say that you're making a $5,000 decision and you're a frontline employee and you've only considered one possibility, you probably don't have enough information, right? You're about to buy a $5,000 tool. Well, have you considered another tool that might only be $1,000, right? So do you have enough information to make the decision? Number two, um, do you, do you um, is the risk acceptably low? So do you have enough information? Is the risk acceptably low? There's a difference between a $50 decision and a $5,000 decision. There's a difference between one that's going to take down a server if something goes wrong and one that's just going to make a minor interruption or whatever, right? So is the risk acceptably low? Number three is, um, do you feel reasonably confident about it? And if the answer to all three of those is yes, then here's my promise to you as the leader. I am never going to get you in trouble for making that decision, even if it goes horribly wrong. It was a crappy decision. I'm never going to yell at you for making that decision. I'm going to applaud you for making the decision. Now, we'll have a conversation about how to make a better decision next time. Let's learn from it. But, but I'm not going to slap your wrist and say, why did you make that? You shouldn't have done that. No. I love it that you did it. Good job taking initiative, trying to, do, trying to make a call, trying to take action. Now let's talk about how to do it better next time. And that kind of, of permission for people to take small, responsible risks and fail and learn from it, I think means that I don't have to be the only one that's making the decisions. I don't have to be involved in everything. So, you know, that was a long rambling answer to your question. No, that was, that, I, was, I, that was great. If people feel free to make decisions and, and also to disagree with me, like I tell people all the time, like, this is a straw man. Here's what I think we should do, but I might not be right. So argue with me, tell me that I'm wrong. Um, and at the end of the day, we're all going to be united about this decision. Even if we don't agree, whatever the decision is made, we're all going to unite, walk out this conference room door and be all, all behind it and try to make it a success. But it doesn't have to be my idea. Um, so anyway, those are, are ways that hopefully my team and my coaches hold me accountable. No, that, that's fantastic. And it, it sounds like you're empowering your employees because I've worked at organizations where every decision had to be approved by some kind of su uh, supervisor to some to right. some length, uh, and there was no free thinking or creative thought. And then the, the owners of the company get upset of like, "Why aren't we making progress?" I'm like, "Because you need to." I, I've literally, Tim, I've had previous bosses 
write my emails for me. Like, this is exactly how I want you to send it out. I'm like, this is craziness. (laughs) Like your time is invested in this. Steve, the way you and I got to where we are was by making mistakes, right? We made mistakes and we learned. Absolutely. So uh, why do I expect my people to never make a mistake? and be able to progress and grow and learn. They're, they're gonna make mistakes and that has to be okay. But hopefully we can contain them, we can put some guardrails around them and not let them like, you know, ship, uh, sink the ship. But I expect my people to make some mistakes and um, that's, how, that's how we're gonna grow and that's how we're gonna move forward a lot faster than me making all the decisions. It sounds like your organization has a lot of what I would consider A players. So how are you sourcing these these this talent so to speak are you using recruiters are you just going like throwing something on zip recruiter like it it looks like you have a really good basis around you now i'm sure things happen people have to be let go just as the nature of the beast like just through the course of years no one's going to stay with you forever but how are you getting this talent so uh, first of all philosophically i'm a big fan of um talent book uh, good to great he talks about hiring as a bus right so you, you've got to get the right people on the bus and then figure out what seat they need to be on, right? So we're going to hire for character, integrity, for um, people that come with batteries included, right, that have some initiative, that have some drive, that are, that are going to take ownership and actually, actually be responsible for results, not just for activities, right? That's what I'm looking for, first of all. And then, I, look, if I find a person that has great character and integrity and initiative and all of that stuff, I'll probably create a position for you if necessary. Like, let me find out what you're good at and, and figure out a way to make money around that or create value around that. Um, so I'm hiring first for character and then for skill. And honestly, even if you don't have all the skills that I need, you can probably, if you're the right kind of person, you can learn the skills pretty fast. So, I mean, I'm not going to take somebody from industry A and put them in a completely unrelated job in industry B. Yeah, you always need your smart and ambitious. Engineer. This yeah, right, yeah. right. There are limits to it, of course. But I, I don't just go on and say, oh, you know how to do X, Y, Z skill. I'll hire you. I, I'm looking for the character first. And the other thing that I would say about that is in the beginning, I hired pretty young, inexperienced, and inexpensive people. And for one thing, that was all I could do because I didn't have any money. Um, but I also told myself that that was really a better way of doing things because I didn't want to hire somebody that had all these other habits and they did things a different, like I wanted to teach him how to do it the way that this company does it. And, um, that made a lot of sense to me. And I told that story for a long time. Uh, and then I, uh, I ended up long story, but I ended up on a private jet with, uh, I think he's a billionaire. I'm not, not certain of that, but he's worth a lot of money. He's very, very successful. He owns two private jets. And, um, so a mutual friend was getting married in another state. And so, he, I, I was flying commercial and, uh, this guy was going to, and the mutual friend, the guy that was getting married said, Oh, you're coming from the same town. You should ride on his jet. Said, Great. I'm yep. Yeah, so, exactly. You have to pull my arm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I ended up uh, hopping a ride on this guy's jet and spent, you know, five hours in the air together round trip and I had a captive audience and this really successful guy. And so I just, I mean, I soaked it in. I learned so much from him, but one of the questions I asked him, what well, he's a good bit older than I am. And I said, what do you know today, maybe something you've learned recently, what do you know today that you wish you knew when you were my age? And he said, oh, he said, well, when I was your age, I hired good people. I hired people that, um, you know, they were friends, they were family members, they were friends of friends, and they were good, good hearted, dedicated, loyal people. Um, but they weren't necessarily the best at what they did. They were they were good, but I had to teach him how to do stuff and they, they weren't the best. Um, he said, at a certain point, I started hiring people who were A players, A plus players. He said that, that were the best and I paid him about a 10% premium over market. I paid him more than they could make anywhere else. Um, and I said, could, like, did you already have that money? Could you? And he said, oh no, I ran a deficit for a while. Like I was, I was losing money, but I was convinced that this was the right thing to do. And I said, so what happened, right? He says, uh, within about a year, he said, and I don't remember the exact, if he doubled or tripled or whatever, but dramatically grew revenue, dramatically grew profit. He was working less. Um, the people were like, everything got better. He, and he said, I wish I'd done that 20 years sooner. Like, hire the best, 
pay them well, facilitate their success, but get out of their way. Don't micromanage. So it, still, don't get me wrong. You still hire good people that are loyal and good hearted and people of character, integrity and all that, but also get people that are A plus players. And so that really made an impression on me. And I was like, you know, how, all right, what do I need to do um, differently to start attracting those A players? Well, the first thing is I've got to be that A plus player that has a vision that's bigger than what, like nobody wants to attach. An A plus player doesn't want to attach to a small vision, right? So you got to have a big vision. You've got to have a big enough opportunity for them and give them enough responsibility and a long enough leash uh, that they're going to be able to run and do great things. So you got to create that right environment. Um, and then there's a whole set of things like how, what what um, networking do you need to do and what kinds of recruiters do you need to work with and all of that to be able to, to get to that level because your average everyday source of employees isn't, that's not where those guys are hanging out. Those guys are already, or I say I'm saying guys, men or women, um, they're not necessarily they're looking for a job. else probably assuredly, right? Exactly, exactly. So you've got to create an opportunity that's so good not just the pay so much, that's part of it, but an opportunity to, to do something that matters with a great team that has a big vision, that has great culture and all, and then, then you can recruit those kind of people. So, um, but I'll tell you, I'm paying more for people now than I ever have in the past um, and, and love and life, right? Love and life. No, that's great advice. And I, I've learned that just from uh, one of John Maxwell's books, um, he discusses about how, as a leader, if you want to have eight players and you're a seven, do you think a 10 is going to want to work for you? Right. No way. Like, you got to right. elevate yourself, man, just to, just to uh, attract people who are, who are a part of your vision. And you made a brilliant point where, like, your vision should be big enough to encompass theirs in a way. Right. Of, like, this, right. Is, where, this is where the rocket ship is going. So that, that's yeah, really sage advice, man. I, I appreciate you sharing that with us. Yeah, not um, not original to me. It came from this guy that um, you know, the, the yeah, two private this, yeah, jet guy. But yeah, yeah but uh, we'll, we'll call him we'll call him Mister X. Whoever yeah, Eric, Eric, right? is, Eric is the name. Eric, yeah. Eric Weir. What, what, I, I mean, I can shout over. I, I'll I'll give his name. Eric Weir. He was actually on my podcast here just uh, a few weeks ago. Um, oh, cool. But super successful guy. He owns Top Golf all over the world and has real estate development. He's made some major films. He's, he's kind of like you and I with lots of interest. So he's in real estate. He's in top golf. He's in uh, wealth management. He's in self storage. He's, uh, he's got half a dozen businesses, probably more than that, that I don't know about. Yeah. He's, it sounds like a Titan of industry, so to speak. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, what I always find fascinating is that most of the entrepreneurs that are very successful have not inherited anything or if they yeah. did, it's a, it's, it's a very minute amount. Um, right. so this whole, this fantasy, I think, it plays in re that doesn't pertain to reality. Is that you know all these wealthy people just were handed everything from their parents? Right. I'm like, I have point them out. Other than Kim Kardashian or any like reality TV stars, right. like I don't, I've never met them. It's a lot of right. self. I mean, they're the Vanderbilts of the world or whatever of that course. have old money washing around. But that's that that's sort of the minority. Mo most of your uh, everyday millionaires and billionaires out there uh, figured out how to make it themselves. Absolutely. Now. I just out of my own curiosity, when these A players get attracted to you, and this is this is something I've always struggled with. Do you go high salary <laughs> with with profit sharing? Do you ever uh, offer equity if they're the right person? Like, what would you say is a, is a great structure? Say, if I want to hire a head of operations, let's just say, yeah, yeah, I, I think it depends on the uh, the situation for sure. I'm one of the fairly new companies that I've started with a partner we're about to hire our first CEO. Um, so far, the partner and I have done, and we've got employees and we've got, you know, leaders in place, but we don't have somebody that's really responsible for everything. And we're about to hire that. And that person will make a salary plus we'll get stock options. And so based on their performance, they'll actually have the opportunity to become a minority partner in the business uh, over time. And so that's one structure that I've used. In other places, I've used profit sharing where in addition to your normal salary, you are rewarded as the company does well. And usually there's some sort of a formula there. So um, I, my favorite one revolves around three things. Uh, the company doing well, so there's a percentage of net profit that gets distributed to everybody. Um, two is individual performance. So basically as your supervisor reviews your performance and, and you, you had a certain number of goals for the year, or for the quarter or whatever, as you achieve more of those, then you get more shares in the profit share program. And so therefore you get a bigger piece of the pie and then just longevity, because the longer you've been with the company, 
the more opportunity you've had to earn shares. And so your long-term high performers in a high performing company are going to win the most and your medium performers that have just joined the company and the company didn't do are going to earn less, but that way everybody's interests are aligned and we all win or lose together. And, and that's kind of my favorite structure. Right. And, and I love that because it, it puts the buck on the, the owner of the company and the employee for like, Hey, the, we do well, you do well. Yep. So like this is, it keeps it where everyone's very vested to your point. Uh, yep. Again, kind of going back, <laughs> going back to that tribe mentality of like, we're in this together type of thing, I think is, is extraordinarily insightful and important. Um, so I really appreciate, appreciate all these amazing gems. I've taken it down my own notations here of where to like take some of your stories and make them into short Instagram reels because it's really yeah, yeah, impactful. Yeah. Stuff. Um, and I always end on this and you kind of harped on it from, uh, from what Eric, wait, the question you asked Eric, it's just funny because this is, I ask every single entrepreneur is on the show, rewinding the clock to a younger Tim and not using any of the answers you already have, but you're, let's say you're 21 to 25 year old. What advice as a 40 year old would you give to that young man? Uh, of not, not, either not, don't sweat the small stuff. Like I'm, I'm just curious, yeah. what would you change oh, about that young man? So, so many things, probably the, the big con, I mean, some of the things that I've already shared, but probably the big concept, um, is a total ripoff from a book by this title, which is who, not how Dan Sullivan, Benjamin Hardy wrote it. You, you're familiar with it. So in, you know, most resourceful, successful entrepreneurs tend to be multi-talented and they just figure out how to do stuff. And so every time you're met with a new opportunity, you're like, okay, how am I going to see that? Every time you're met with a new threat, like how am I going to mitigate that? Every time you're, 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 you're always figuring out how. Dan Sullivan says, no, that's the wrong question. You need to figure out who already knows how to seize that opportunity or mitigate that threat or pro solve that problem or whatever it is. And, and you need to either hire them or contract them or buy their product or service or whatever it is. And when you build this whole team of people who are working in their unique ability, doing what they love to do and what they're really good at, and there's, there's like an intersection of skill and passion. And you've got this person who loves to do and is good at something totally different from this person who loves and, and is good at something else and different than you. And you put all that together in this unique ability teamwork, man, magic happens. And two plus two equals not four, but 40. Um, and so, that's really what I have tried to do in recent years is figure out how do I put together a team of high performers that do the work, uh, who, not how. So that's probably the advice I'd give to the 21 year old Tim. Yeah. And I, I have suffered from that fallacy of like, I need to do everything myself as a business owner. And I've come to terms that one, I'm not good at everything. Even in the stuff that I really excel at, let's say it's sales. If I can get someone where they're 80% of what my success margin is, that's an amazing win to me. Because that's something that I'm not, don't have to do anymore. So my time now is free to do other things. Yeah. So that, that's, that's great Beautiful advice thing. to the younger Tim, for sure. Yep. And hopefully people take that advice to heart, especially service-based business owners. I know everyone, that's your product, it's your baby, but you know, let go of the reins a little bit and get the key players in and you will achieve an explosive growth. It's almost a guarantee as Mr. Joyner can attest it. All right, well, Tim, I really appreciate your your time uh, and your dedication to your craft. You're someone that I hope to as aspire to be as an entrepreneur myself, to have as many companies. Uh, right now, I I have five or six. I'm look, exiting one, but you know, it's uh, I got to grow them now into the stratosphere. That's the uh, that's the idea. Yeah, so, fun well, stuff. I, I have no doubt that you will. Uh, day by day, my friend, day by day. I, um, to your mouth, to God's ears, as the saying goes, right? There you go. All right, Tim. I appreciate you. Um, if, oh, if anyone wants to check out, you do have a podcast. It's called Grow With Tim. So if anyone wants, goes into Apple Podcasts, check it out. Uh, Tim also interviews other entrepreneurs, just like the guy, uh, gentleman Eric Weary mentioned. Uh, he speaks about leadership, about growth. It's an excellent listen. I just binge watched almost all of his episodes. Uh, so if you enjoy this content, I promise you'll like his uh, nearly as much, if not better. Um, and if someone wants to learn more about your companies, the services you offer, um, what, what are some to name a few that's, that they can check out, Tim? Yeah, uh, Solutions ITW is the software company that I mentioned. Um, and there's all kinds of different businesses do different things, but I'll plug one other one. Polished.shoe is my men's shoe company. We make shoes in Brazil, real leather, high quality materials, comfortable shoes that are, uh, I think, pretty stylish. So uh, check out Polished.shoe um, or you can find any of my social media stuff at growwiththem.com. And if, if uh, memory serves, you're also a fractional uh, consultant. So if anyone do, who's a do business owner struggling to yep. get to the next, next level, this is your man to, to call. So 
Fun stuff, man. Steve, always a pleasure. It's good to see you, my friend. Absolutely. Thanks again. Till next time.